Well, grace to you and peace from the God who gives us all we need. <clears throat> in the Field Museum in Chicago, one of the star attractions is a dinosaur exhibit displaying a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton named Sue. <coughs> And this skeleton is incredibly important to the scientific community because she holds the records for pretty much every T-Rex related award you can think of. She is the largest T-Rex ever discovered and the most complete skeleton ever excavated. Her fossilized bones were among the best preserved ever found. And her discovery in a bluff outside of Faith, South Dakota in 1990 set off one of the fiercest battles for ownership of a dinosaur skeleton that the scientific community has ever seen, after which the Field Museum in Chicago purchased her for a cool $8.3 million, the most ever paid for any fossil. To date, Sue has taught us more about dinosaur biology, intelligence, and behavior than any other specimen. And that's just what she's achieved in death. When she was alive some 67 million years ago, Sue would have been one of the fiercest hunters on Earth. She was 40 feet long and weighed over 15 tons. And some of her teeth, and she had around 60 of them, measured nearly a foot. Her bite was the most powerful of any land animal yet discovered. Scientists think she could chase down her prey at around 30 miles an hour, that she could see better than a hawk and smell better than a dog, and that the skin on her snout was sensitive enough to measure the temperature of the nest that she made for her young. Sue was one of God's mightiest creatures, both in her own day and in ours. She was so superlative in every way that she stretches the limits of our imaginations. And so it may be striking to learn that mighty Sue was felled not by something equally grandiose like a meteor or another T-Rex or even time itself, but by a lowly parasite, a tiny protozoa called Trichomanus gallinae. Trichomanus created lesions in the Sue's jaw and throat, which led to inflammation and infection that made it impossible for her to swallow. Sue, the titanic predator, the apex of the food chain, most likely starved to death. It is sobering to remember that death is a great equalizer. Powerful or humble, weak or strong, notable or not, we all end up the same way. It's a melancholy realization, but one that we are urged to keep in mind in all of the texts from today, and especially from the reading from today's Gospel of Luke. Our passage begins with a man approaching Jesus with a complaint. Teacher, he says, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus rolls his eyes and says, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. On the surface, we might claim that we know this. Of course, we think to ourselves, of course life is more than just money and things. You can't take it with you. And yet the way that we live our lives especially here, in the richest and most capitalist country on the planet, that betrays what we truly think. We swarm to Black Friday sales, trampling each other at the doors of big box sales in our rush to get the best deals. We flock to Amazon on Prime Day, caring not that the workers in the fulfillment centers can't even take long enough breaks to get to the bathroom, or that the goods we are ordering come largely from sweatshops overseas with lax safety standards and child laborers. But Jesus knows that we will always have trouble with this teaching. And so he tells a parable to help refocus our attention away from the material things of this life to what truly matters. The parable Jesus tells is often called the parable of the rich fool. It goes like this. A farmer produces so much from his land that he doesn't have enough room to store his crops. He thinks to himself, what am I gonna do about this? 
I know. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger barns, and then I'll have enough stored up that I can eat, drink, and be merry for many years. But God comes to the farmer and says, You fool, you will die this very night. And then what good will all your hoarded wealth be to you? The farmer in this parable is a fool because he does not realize the futility of what he attempts. To hoard the material wealth he has amassed does not provide him with the security that he seeks. For the reality of this world is outside of human control. He already has all that he needs, so storing up his crops won't provide him with more comfort or with more useful resources. Instead, by hoarding his abundance, by thinking only of himself, all he accomplishes is to keep what he has out of the hands of those around him who could benefit from it. Those in his community whose lives could be improved by the excess he has created. Now, in many parables like this one, Jesus speaks in hyperbole. That is, he speaks with intentional exaggeration to make a deeper point. So please don't think that this is a parable about how we should all avoid making sound financial decisions or planning ahead. Instead, this is a parable about how we are called to live not just for ourselves. The farmer from the parable is a fool because he seeks to ensure his own personal wealth and welfare. But throughout the Bible, God calls us to look out for more than our own personal interests, to take on the well-being of our neighbor as if it were our own. We are called to set aside our fear, to care even for those whom society would tell us are our enemies because of where they come from, how they look, or what they believe to set aside our greed to care for those who are more vulnerable because they are, have less power or fewer resources than we do. God commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to go out of our way, even at times to sacrifice some of our own material goods so that those who need our help might be cared for and loved. This is a God who calls us to behave as believers and followers of Christ. And it is through acts like these that we bring the kingdom of God to earth. The farmer in the parable should have thrown a party with his riches. Rather than coming up with ways to squirrel away his wealth for himself in new barns, he could have thrown a feast for his neighbors and invited all the needy drawn those around him into closer community and shared, invited them to share in the blessings that he had received, acknowledging that everything that we have comes not through our own doing, but as a gift from the Creator. Then when he perished that night, he would have been surrounded by friends who had been blessed by his generosity and spent the evening toasting his kindness instead of contemplating his greed all alone. I can't help but wonder what God might be trying to tell us through this story today in the wake of another devastating act of violence in our nation. 29 people were killed in shootings in Texas and Ohio yesterday. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ in this day and age, in America in 2019? As Christians, we are called to be in the world, but not of the world. We are called to remember that our true home is not in the geography in which we lay our physical bodies, but with our Lord in heaven. And so as dual citizens of both this land and the kingdom of heaven, what is our role in times like these? You see, we live in the tension of choices. We enjoy innumerable, wonderful freedoms living in America, including our Second Amendment rights, but we also follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who calls us to turn our swords into plowshares. We live in a strong country that claims it must defend its borders and its national sovereignty, but we follow a God who has called us to love our neighbors and who reminds us again and again that we are, in fact, all one in the body of Christ. 
These are hard issues. They get at what the core of what it means to be a citizen of both this world and the kingdom of heaven. And often we hear that there are no easy answers to these hard issues. And that may be true. But I wonder if perhaps we say that to get ourselves off the hook. To put off for another day the question of whether we are really called to set aside our wealth, our power, our privilege, for the sake of the justice to which God calls us. I worry that in wringing our hands as we think about how hard it is to sacrifice what we want for what the world needs, that we are becoming like the farmer in the parable and missing what is important. Because the truth is that our riches, our possessions, our power, and our might can no more save us than Sue the T-Rex's size or strength or foot-long teeth could save her. Our only hope, the only thing that saves, is love. Love like the love that Christ had for us. Love that sacrifices for the neighbor. Love that does not put itself first. Love that transcends both fear and greed. Love that gives up that which doesn't ultimately matter so that all may share in that which matters most of all. The love of God is so bountiful, so overflowing that it does not need to be amassed or stored away. Because in this love, there is more than enough to go around. That is the love that Christ has for us and that we are empowered in Christ to shower upon each other. If we have love like this, we are rich beyond imagination. Thanks be to God. Amen.